Well, good morning, folks. Great to be here during Stampede Week as we Albertans are celebrating leading Canada out of the COVID crisis and into economic growth. Uh, fantastic to see uh, yet more positive economic news uh, about our tech sector and film and television. I just finished a roundtable with key leaders of the oil and gas industry who uh, are uh, experiencing strong prices and uh, a lot of optimism. So we're seeing and feeling that all around the province. Today I'm here to announce an important step forward in direct democracy, giving Albertans more power to make uh, decisions on big issues that matter to them uh, and to our future. In the last election campaign, our government was elected on a commitment to let Albertans say yes to a fair deal by uh, having a vote on equalization in the Canadian Constitution. And I'm pleased to confirm today uh, that that is a promise made and a promise kept. On October the 18th, uh, as we committed to in our platform, Albertans will be going to the polls to vote on uh, reforming equalization, on saying yes to a fair deal. Uh, on making the principle of equalization pay payments, uh, on removing that principle from the Constitution to maximize our leverage as we fight for a fair deal on all fronts and, and fight for a strong Alberta economy. We also committed to Albertans in the last campaign that we would uh, renew the tradition of Albertans electing their representatives in the Senate of Canada, the upper chamber of Canada's parliament. We Albertans have always been champions of democracy in the Canadian Federation and of Senate reform in particular. We've had uh, four Senate elections in our history and five senators chosen through those elections who actually were appointed to Canada's Senate, two of them who serve there right now. So I'm happy to confirm uh, another promise made and another promise kept. Albertans will be uh, ha given an opportunity to choose their senators uh, to sit in the upper chamber on October the 18th. Uh, in fact, I raised this issue with Prime Minister Trudeau during his uh, trip to Calgary last week, um, a asking that the, the two current vacancies in this Canadian Senate for Alberta be left open so that they can be filled uh, by the top two vote-getters of the uh, Senate election on October 18. I'm also pleased today to announce that Albertans will be given an opportunity uh, to vote on whether to end the practice of changing our clocks twice every year on uh, the question of daylight savings time. Now, Minister Glubish will have more to say about this. This is an issue, actually, that Albertans have voted on twice in referendums in the past, uh, back in the, uh, in the 1950s, and they chose the, the current system, which has us changing the clock once a year. Um, but British Columbia, uh, our province to our west, has decided to stick with one clock year-round, just like Saskatchewan always has, and uh, neighboring st states to our south and territories to our north have all decided uh, to stick to one clock. So we think uh, it's a great opportunity for Albertans to speak to an issue that will uh, affect them in a very direct way. As you know, following the re-election of Justin Trudeau's government in the fall of 2019, uh, Albertans were uh, rightly frustrated to see a Prime Minister elected after having openly campaigned against Alberta and our largest job creating industry, our energy sector. And that's why Alberta's government appointed the Fair Deal Panel uh, to consult with Albertans about how we can get a fair deal in the Federation. And uh, what, two of the recommendations coming, of that, co coming out of the Fair Deal report were that Alberta pursue uh, the potential creation of our own uh, provincial pension plan and of an Alberta provincial police force, just like Quebec has. Of course, Ontario, Quebec and Newfoundland all have their own uh, prov uh, provincial police forces that provide strong, effective and accountable community policing. And, of course, Quebec, since the mid-1960s, has successfully operated its own uh, public pension program. So we have done uh, significant research into these two big ideas about how to build a, a stronger, uh, more resilient Alberta. And Ministers uh, Taze and Madhu will be speaking about uh, the work that's been done to date and uh, more work that yet is yet to be done before uh, we consult directly with Albertans uh, in the future. We want to get those big issues right. We don't want to rush them. There are, uh, they are both complex issues. I think they both hold enormous potential uh, for a stronger and more prosperous Alberta. 
Uh, I'll just close before referring to uh, my colleagues here to the importance of the equalization referendum that we'll be facing on October the 18th. Alberta has been the engine of Canada's prosperity in recent decades. We have contributed through our federal taxes over $600 billion to the rest of Canada. And I believe Albertans are proud of the role, the nation building role that we have played. We Albertans are happy to share some of our good fortune when times are good here, but bad elsewhere. But what we find very frustrating is a system which has had us contributing on average $20 billion a year net through our federal taxes to other provinces, even while we have been living through a prolonged recession, a period of economic decline and stagnation with high unemployment, low incomes, lower incomes, and huge uh, provincial deficits. And yet we have been, through our federal taxes, through the ever-growing, for example, equalization payments uh, to one particular province, we've been contributing to other provinces with higher rates of economic growth, lower rates of employment, running big provincial fiscal surpluses. It just isn't fair. And what is particularly unfair is to subsidize public services in other provinces that have stood in the way of the development of our resources the key industry which helps to pay uh, for the equalization and all of the other fiscal transfers in the Federation. So October the 18th is a chance to say yes to a fair deal, to give the government of Alberta more leverage as we negotiate for a fair deal in the Federation. Uh, this is something the vast majority of Albertans, I believe, support. It's a chance for us to speak to our fellow Canadians in a friendly way and to remind them of the huge generosity of Alberta taxpayers in recent decades and simply to ask for the ability to develop our economy, our resources, to create jobs so that we can continue to share some of our good fortune with the rest of Canada. With that, I'm going to uh, turn the podium over uh, to Minister for Service Alberta, uh, Nate Glubish, who will speak about the forthcoming October 18th referendum on daylight savings time. Nate. Well, thank you, Premier, uh, and thank you for leading Alberta's uh, approach to this referendum initiative. Uh, when we first asked Albertans uh, in a survey in late 2019 about whether or not to stop changing our clocks and to adopt daylight saving time year-round, we received more than 141,000 responses in a, over a three-week period. And since that time, my office has continued to receive a significant amount of questions and correspondence on this very issue. And as a father to an almost two-year-old son, I can relate to all of the families out there who would love to end the practice of changing our clocks. I think it's fair to say that following the survey, many Albertans hoped for an immediate change to the way we observe time. But as you know, last March, the pandemic began in Alberta in a big way, and Alberta's government needed to focus uh, on and to prioritize our response to it. Fortunately, thanks to the hard work of Albertans in following public health guidelines and getting vaccinated, we have been able to open up this province faster than anywhere else in the country, and Albertans are in line for the best summer ever. And now we can come back and take a look at this important question of daylight saving time, as Albertans have been hoping that we would. It is clear that Albertans are passionate about this, and uh, a change on this matter should not be taken lightly. How Albertans calculate time affects literally everyone in this province, as well as others beyond our borders. We know that in Canada, our neighbours in Saskatchewan do not fall back by an hour in the fall, and nor do they spring forward uh, in the spring. This makes things interesting for the border city of Lloydminster, which, uh, with the Alberta time zone extending beyond its borders to include the entire city. Last spring, the Yukon changed their clocks for the last time, opting to stay permanently on summer hours. British Columbia has passed legislation to stay on permanent summer hours, although they have not yet enacted their legislation. They will change their clocks for the last time when other jurisdictions in the Pacific region are ready to do the same. Similarly, Ontario has passed legislation to stay on permanent summer hours, though they will only bring that legislation into force when Quebec and New York State take the same decision. South of the border, a debate on ending the twice annual time change is also growing. To date, up to 31 states have had or are having a debate on if they should stay on permanent summer hours, and of those states, 17 have passed legislation or a resolution to adopt daylight saving time permanently, including Montana, Washington, and Oregon. 
If we go even further away, debate is also taking place in the European Union, which is the only other region in the world where seasonal time changes of this nature are common. But there's a lot to consider before Alberta brings an end to the seasonal time changes uh, th that, uh, that have been a practice here for decades. I often hear from Albertans who want to stop changing their clocks, but I also hear from Albertans and concerned business owners and representatives who have concerns about moving away from the seasonal time change. For instance, we know that airlines and airport authorities are concerned about the impacts that this could potentially have on their schedules, as are members of Alberta's tourism sector. Professional sports organizations with ties to national broadcasts, such as the NHL, will all, have also expressed some concerns. For any industry that relies on a consistent schedule to operate, changing the way that we set our clocks in Alberta would be a fundamental shift. This is one reason why it is so important that we enable all Albertans to have a say in how Alberta observes time. It is also a critical reason why we should not rush into anything but give businesses and families time to prepare and adjust. Right from the time I first announced an online survey for Albertans to complete, I said it was important that we synchronize as much as possible with other jurisdictions, which will help us to mitigate many of the potential impacts. There's no question in my mind that many Albertans would like to stop changing their clocks twice a year. It would make good sense to remain on daylight saving time, if for no other reason than because we want to remain synchronized with our neighbors as much as possible. And the debate taking place by our neighbors and others across Canada and the United States is centered on permanent summer hours. Service Alberta will continue to research the potential positive and negative impacts of ending the time change and to examine ways to mitigate any of the challenges that may arise. But our next step is to ask Albertans a clear question about ending time change using the most robust survey tool we have, which is a referendum. And so on October 18th, when Albertans go to the polls to elect new municipal governments and school board trustees, we will also be asking them about this twice annual time change. We want every Albertan to have the opportunity to tell us what they think, which will help us to make the best decision possible and to represent the interests of the people we serve. We will be taking the summer to finalize the specific question that Albertans will be asked. Um, and it will be really great to hear from much more than just the 141,000 Albertans uh, that, that uh, participated in our survey in 2019. I'm looking forward to seeing what all of you have to say about this and where it will lead us. Following the referendum on October 18th, I looked forward to sharing those results with you. Thank you, and I'll turn it now over to Minister Taves. Well, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Premier. And good morning. Uh, I'm here today uh, to let Albertans know that a potential Alberta pension plan will not be on the referendum ballot this fall. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, in reference to the Premier's comments around the Fair Deal panel, in August 2019, the Fair Deal panel made recommendations to, and I quote, to develop a comprehensive plan to create an Alberta pension plan and withdraw from the Canada Pension Plan. Subsequently, provide Albertans the opportunity via a referendum to vote for or against withdrawing from the Canada Pension Plan and creating the Alberta Pension Plan. As such, Treasury Board and Finance, through a competitive process, selected Morneau Chappelle, now known as LifeWorks, to undertake a detailed analysis of the costs, benefits, and structure of a potential Alberta Pension Plan. An Alberta Pension Plan is a very complex and multifaceted issue, and the important work of completing a full actuarial, econometric, and structural analysis so that Albertans can be an make an educated and well-informed choice is ongoing. We look forward to sharing our findings with Albertans when the work is completed. And as we've said before, Albertans will have the final say on whether or not the province establishes an Alberta Pension Plan. Now, I believe an Alberta Pension Plan continues to hold great promise and opportunity uh, for Albertans today and in the future, but it's critically important that uh, we do our work to ensure that Albertans are well-informed so that they can make uh, a well-informed choice uh, when we take this to referendum. Thank you. Good morning. 
And, and thank you to all of you uh, for coming out uh, this morning. As the Premier has explained, our government views the referendum questions as an important way for Albertans to have a say in how our province is run. By allowing Albertans to voice their approval or opposition to matters of public interest, we are encouraging them to become more active and engaged citizens. As you know, there will be two referendum questions this fall on equalization and daylight saving time. In the weeks leading up to today's announcement, there has been some speculation that this fall's municipal elections would include a question about creating an Alberta Provincial Police Service to replace the RCMP. I can confirm today that while we did consider including such a question, it wouldn't be asked this fall. But to be clear, we are not ignoring the aspirations of Albertans who desire a made in Alberta Provincial Police Service, nor are we rushing to implementation. We are taking a serious look at this. Although this is a unique opportunity to improve how provincial policing is delivered to Albertans, particularly those living in rural areas, we need to take the time needed to conduct additional study and hear from all stakeholders. Through the Fair Deal panel, many Albertans who are policed by the RCMP told us clearly that they want to see Alberta build its own provincial police to improve policing in all our communities. Alberta's government has an obligation to listen to these concerns and explore how a police service designed and made in Alberta, not Ottawa, would improve the safety and security of Albertans and their property and communities. We also are planning to consult more with stakeholders and seek out local policing perspectives as part of understanding the implications of establishing an Alberta Provincial Police Service. Transforming Alberta's law enforcement system in this way would entail many operational, logistical, and financial details, which is why we are taking the time to continue looking into it as part of determining what the next steps would look like. And obviously, we still have the ability to ask Albertans at some future date. Thank you for being here. With that, we're open to your questions. Thank you, Minister and Premier. So we'll, yeah, now we'll go to questions and answers. If you could just do one question and one follow-up, that would be great, and state your name and outlet. So we'll start in the room, and then we can go to the phone. So are there any questions in the room? Go ahead. Uh, for the Premier. Hi, Elise Bonchio with CBC. Uh, I'm just wondering, are you planning to release the reports that you've commissioned regarding these questions, including the ones that aren't on uh, the ballot this fall? Yes, at an appropriate time, uh, we have a number, uh, significant research that's ongoing with respect to both, both the pension and police programs for Alberta. And uh, in the case of the pensions, uh, there's uh, ongoing actuarial analysis, legal analysis, uh, structural and econometric analyses. Uh, we are actually doing kind of redundant reports because this is such a big and complex issue. And we want to present, uh, when we uh, release these reports, we want to present Albertans with uh, as much information as possible uh, so that they can make an informed decision. Uh, similarity with police, uh, the, per the idea of an Alberta Provincial Police Force, I think it holds great promise for improving uh, community policing, response times, uh, and uh, improving uh, imp policing uh, with Indigenous communities. Uh, but we came to the conclusion that more work is needed. Um, in particular, you know, the, uh, we engaged, uh, was it Deloitte Touche? Uh, Minister, sorry, sorry, oh, sorry, Price Waterhouse Cooper, excuse me, to, to engage in a uh, technical review. Uh, they came up with some very interesting uh, recommendations. I know Minister Maddy will be releasing that report uh, in due course. And um, that's the same firm that did the review for the city of Surrey, British Columbia, that guided their um, uh, development of a municipal police force pulling out of the RCMP contract. A lot of very interesting information, but we acknowledge that there's a need for much deeper consultation with First Nations um, and with municipalities, given how much this would, uh, the consequences this would have for them. So um, we think uh, taking a bit more time uh, to dig more deeply into those kinds of consultations uh, is the right thing to do at this point. And then just to follow up quickly, um, shifting gears a little bit, what has the Infrastructure Bank told the province about 
what it's considering when it comes to the Calgary Banff rail line? Well, our cabinet has approved uh, a uh, having um, Invest Alberta uh, pursue a, a uh, feasibility study with the Canada Infrastructure Bank on a prospective uh, Calgary to Banff uh, tourism rail service. Uh, we think it, it upholds a lot of great potential uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, just to improve the overall tourism experience for ca the crown jewel of Canadian tourism. Uh, secondly, it would actually reduce emissions and get more cars off the road, which would also be good for uh, wildlife and just the natural habitat in Banff National Park. We understand Banff Park has the highest emissions, uh, CO2 emissions of any major park I in the world. Uh, that's because of all the car traffic, and this would take a, a, a huge number of vehicles off the road while at the, simultaneously improving the tourism experience. We also think that it would help uh, the uh, mountain parks address the long-standing challenge of um, labor shortages. Uh, the federal government, Parks Canada, is not approving any significant new construction in Banff, and that means there's a real housing, there's always a housing challenge, and there's always a labor challenge. And so if, if a rail service could help to bring folks who are currently unemployed or underemployed in Calgary, and Camor, for example, and perhaps the perhaps Morley uh, from the uh, Stony Reserve, up to uh, uh, to jobs that are available in Banff, that would also uh, help to create jobs. Uh, of course, it would also create construction jobs in the development of the project. Um, and I know that Banff is considering a, a long-term vision of being a much more of a pedestrian experience, like similar uh, mountain resort towns in uh, Europe. So we think it, it, the, the concept holds a lot of potential, but uh, we need to ensure that due diligence is done um, and that this, uh, this, is a, 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 this project makes good financial sense. Uh, Canada Infrastructure Bank, we appreciate their, their interest. Uh, we've been working uh, with them for the past couple of years, um, and now we're taking the next step forward on a, on a very serious feasibility study. Key and Bexley with the counter signal. Are you concerned that city like, urban voters will pose an obstacle to removing uh, Trudeau's RCMP from Alberta? It, it's largely rural voters that want to get rid of them because they're subjected to the RCMP. Calgary. Well, we, that's a good question. We haven't made any decisions, final decisions yet, about this. Uh, we we want respectfully to engage our First Nations communities in Alberta uh, about um, uh, the implications of changing the. Uh, uh, the administration of, of uh, policing, and we also want to, to have a really respectful dialogue with the municipalities. Now, having said that, um, we have not made final decisions about whether or when to proceed uh, with a possible referendum. Um, I will note that we have the ability under the Referendum Act to uh, hold referenda uh, in certain regions of the province. So one possibility, no, no final decision has been made on this, but one possibility would be to invite uh, only Albertans who are policed by the RCMP and who would be directly affected by this to vote on it. Because um, urban Albertans, uh, certainly in the, in the two biggest cities and five other communities, have the benefit of their own municipal local police services. And they would not be affected by shifting um, to a provincial police force in the rest of the province. Uh, I, th I think an argu a strong argument can be made that it's only those who would be directly affected uh, who should have the ultimate say. So that's a possibility. No final decision has been made, though. Do you have a follow-up? No, that's okay. Any more in the room? Member. Uh, and I won't have a follow-up, just a quick question. Um, how confident are you that there will be changes to equalization if Albertans in a referendum vote to, to, to tell you and tell the government that they want that? How confident are you that that yes vote to changes will actually lead to changes? Because, you know, I'm sure you understand Albertans might be a little bit skeptical about and I, Ottawa changing the program. Sure. I uh, Look, I've always said that a, a, a yes vote on, on the principle of equalization does not automatically change equalization. It doesn't remove it from the Constitution. We cannot do that unilaterally. What it does is to elevate Alberta's fight for fairness to the top of the national agenda. In a sense, it takes a page out of Quebec, Quebec's playbook and how it has become uh, the strongest uh, and most autonomous province in the Canadian Federation. Uh, and, and so I think it's just giving Albertans the chance to speak to this one glaring example of fiscal unfairness 
that we put a spotlight on our demands for fairness. At the end of the day, uh, I don't think Albertans are against sharing some of our um, good fortune with other parts of the country. That's really not the point here. The point is, we want to say to our fellow Canadians, if you want to benefit from the wealth that is produced by the hard work of Albertans, you've got to let us get to work. If you want to benefit from our resource wealth, you've got to let us develop the resource wealth. So it's a way of sending a message to our friends across the country. Uh, if you like, um, if you're in Quebec and you like super low tuition rates and subsidized daycare and, uh, and having a big surplus, good on you. But help us help you by, by getting out of the way on the issues like pipelines. Let's, as I, as I said, the day I, with this government was elected, uh, let's be partners in prosperity. That's the message we hope to send. So I, I, um, I don't expect that a yes vote will, will result in an immediate change in the equalization formula or an amendment to the Constitution. What it will do is give Albertans to say yes more broadly to a fair deal and send a message to our fellow Canadians about just how serious we are on that. Senator here. Hi, uh, Alana Smith of the Canadian Press. Uh, I have a question for the Premier about the droughts affecting farmers. I'm wondering if you can tell us kind of, or give us a sense of how bad it is out there and how these conditions are affecting Alberta farmers kind of historically? Well, my understanding is that it's, uh, uh, there is, there's coarse dry weather in certain regions um, and uh, some, it's been quite severe. Uh, in other areas, uh, I think farmers are optimistic that with a bit more moisture this summer, they can still get decent yields. But I do know that Minister Drieschen, Minister of Agriculture, uh, is calling upon the federal government uh, to um, bring into force the Ag Stabilization Program, which effectively is a crop insurance program, uh, to support those farmers that have been severely affected by very dry weather and are likely to have very poor yields this year. I would actually invite my finance minister, because he's a rancher who, uh, with a very close uh, connection to the ag community, also comment on this, in part because he's also responsible for Alberta's ag, subs uh, ag insurance programs. Sure, good. Thank, thanks, Premier. And I think a very timely question, uh, because we are seeing uh, a very significant drought, certainly in, in key parts of the province and in a larger part of the province than, than we normally would. Now, as the Premier noted, there are some regions that uh, still remain in good shape. And, uh, and, and I will say this, our agriculture community, our farmers and ranchers are resilient, they're innovative, and they always find a way to make it through. That being said, uh, again, further, further to the Premier's point, Minister Drieschen has is already working with uh, actually uh, Saskatchewan and I believe Manitoba in calling on the federal government to uh, invoke the Egg Recovery Program, which is a program that uh, could be used to provide some additional assistance. I know Minister Drieschen has also been working actively, proactively with AFSC here just even in the, in the last few days to ensure that uh, their assessors can get out into those regions that are hard hit so that uh, any, any value in crop residue uh, can, can be, be salvaged, whether it's through grazing cattle or maybe putting it up as feed. Uh, and that assessment then needs to be done on a timely basis. So Minister Drieschen and AFSC are working on that and, uh, and we continue to monitor. Just to follow on that, how fast could that come into practice and is there any sort of emergency or immediate relief you're asking for from the federal government? Well, uh, again, um, uh, the Egg Recovery Program uh, is, is a program designed uh, to uh, effectively provide funding and through, through what would be a, a specific targeted measure related to the challenge. So I believe it should be able to be developed uh, reasonably quickly, but I think really right now, the most acute need is to ensure that AFSC can be out in the field ensuring that they're assessing crops so that farmers with crop insurance can in fact then utilize the, the residual value of that crop and, and know that their crop insurance will back them up. I think we'll go to the phones now. Uh, operator, can you please put through our first caller? Andrew Lawton, True North. Good morning, Premier. I wanted to follow up on a, an earlier question that was asked from the room regarding the equalization referendum. Right now, the federal government is not committing to respecting the results of Alberta's Senate elections. The federal government was elected without any support in Alberta. Where's the requirement for the federal government to even pay attention, let alone to adopt anything or advance anything that the referendum pushes for? The answer, Andrew, is democracy. 
does this federal government respect democracy or does it not respect democracy? Th these are uh, powerful democratic statements that Albertans will be making on October the 18th. Previous prime ministers have used their discretion to appoint uh, individuals elected by Albertans to Canada's Senate. In fact, that I would argue it's become a, a convention, a tradition of sorts, and uh, I urge the Prime Minister to respect that democratic tradition. He did uh, say something interesting to me in that meeting. He said, you know, uh, Premier, you should encourage the candidates seeking election to the Senate to apply through the for appointment through the uh, Senate election process that his government has established. Uh, and went on to say, um, uh, if they go through that process and they they also happen to to uh, prevail in your uh, pr provincial election, uh, maybe that's something that we would consider. So I, I was encouraged to hear uh, the prime minister open the door at least a little bit uh, to the possibility in, in his government of respecting the uh, tradition of appointing elected senators, and we will um, uh, continue to. Uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, I encourage Albertans in large numbers to come out and, and vote in those elections to make a powerful statement uh, that uh, we will certainly convey to Ottawa. On the question of equalization, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada in its 1998 Quebec secession reference uh, determined that if a province holds a referendum with a clear question and a clear majority votes in favour of a proposed constitutional amendment, that the federal government then has a binding obligation to negotiate that issue in good faith with the province. So what's good for Quebec is surely good for Alberta. Uh, this is a federation. And if that's the, the law, as determined by the Supreme Court, as applies to Quebec, then it has to apply to Alberta. That's just common sense. So uh, should a majority of Albertans vote yes for a fair deal uh, on October the 18th, uh, we believe that triggers the uh, decision of the Supreme Court of Canada from the Quebec secession reference in terms of requiring negotiations. And it's in those negotiations, it's in those negotiations that we would bring forward our, our uh, proposals for reforming equalization uh, and our broader demands with respect to a fair deal. It doesn't stop us, I should add, Andrew, it does not stop us from uh, continuing to fight on multiple fronts uh, for this province's economic future as we are doing, for example, through our own constitutional challenge of uh, Mr. Trudeau's No More Pipelines Law, Bill C-69, uh, in a reference that is uh, pending before the Alberta Court of Appeal. And Andrew, do you have a follow-up question? I do. Uh, thank you, Premier. I know you were very clear in terms of this week that Alberta will not pursue any vaccine passport and, and will not uh, recognize any effort as such in the federal government. I wanted to ask about uh, the local business level. If an individual business in Alberta were to uh, require proof of vaccination for its clientele or its staff, uh, where would that fit into your vision, either you know, legally or morally? Well, as I've said, we're concerned about privacy rights, and um, we will not facilitate uh, vaccine passports in this province. We believe that... Um, uh, certainly for receiving government services, for example, it would be uh, inappropriate to require people to disclose uh, their personal health status. Uh, requiring that people disclose their personal health status can only be done under, under Alberta law for very narrow uh, purposes, like, for example, applying for life insurance, things that have a very uh, legitimate and narrow purpose. Um, so a broad uh, requirement that people in the population disclose their personal health information uh, would, in our view, be a violation of uh, the spirit, if not the letter, of the Health Information Act and the principle of uh, protecting people's privacy. Um, so uh, I would discourage businesses from going down that route. Um, on the other hand, if individuals choose voluntarily to share with a business um, evidence about their having been vaccinated, I guess that's their choice, but we aren't going to take any steps to facilitate that uh, in a formal way. Um, and we did consider, you know, potentially bringing forward legislation, but, uh, uh, but we, again, our view was that privacy is already protected under the Privacy Act and the, um, excuse me, it's actually called the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act in Alberta, and the uh, Health Information Act. And uh, we would just uh, suggest that employers look very closely uh, at, at those privacy rights before they um, 
uh, potentially infringe on people's privacy rights. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. So we'll take one more from the phones and we'll finish last question in the room. So operator, can you please put through our next caller? Lisa Corbella, Post Media. Yes, thank you. This is a question for Minister Glubish. Uh, my question is obviously to do with daylight savings. My understanding is that your question is going to ask Albertans if they want to stick with daylight savings time, but I've been speaking with an expert or a, a, a circadian rhythm expert, and he says that the best thing to do would be to return to standard time. So I'm wondering if you're um, considering keeping the time to standard time and not to daylight savings time. Apparently, um, cancer rates will increase, uh, diabetes will increase if we stick with the daylight savings because of delaying the time that morning starts. So I'm just wondering where you stand on that. Sure. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, and, and just uh, to be clear, we're still working on the final uh, wording of the question to ensure that we're bringing a very clear question to Albertans. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to hearing what Albertans will have to say on this. We know that uh, everyone has a strong opinion on this, regardless of where they land. Uh, and we're going to want to hear those opinions. And that's what this referendum will uh, help us to do. So at this time, uh, we do not have the final wording the question, but we'll uh, be sure to share that with you as soon as it's ready. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up, Leisha? I do. Um, so we, uh, you were mentioning that um, when you had that uh, those poll questions on the website, um, that option wasn't offered. So you didn't give the option of sticking with standard time or natural time. I'm wondering, so I'm, uh, is that on the table? And um, have you consulted with the experts about what's best for humans in terms of what time zone we're in? Sure. Well, one of the things that we're considering as we uh, determine the, the exact nature of the question uh, is, of course, balancing the different views that we know are out there on this matter, uh, it, but also recognizing the, the trend of where other jurisdictions are going. Uh, I've said before uh, that... Um, there's a danger of acting in isolation uh, on this to be the only ones moving forward regardless of what our choice, but there's just as much of a danger uh, of uh, acting, um, of not acting in isolation. So, uh, you know, as I've said, there's a growing trend of other jurisdictions across Canada and in the U.S. who are uh, focusing on standardizing on daylight time, on summer hours uh, year-round, and it would be, uh, it's important that we consider that as we uh, determine exactly what our question will be. One more. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Hi, question for the Premier. Premier, you've been talking to oil patch CEOs this week. I know encouraging them to spend more money on capital spending to create more jobs. And I'm wondering what kind of commitments are you getting from them that they're going to spend more money this year and in 2022? And what can your government do to get more money coming? Great question. In fact, we just met this morning with uh, CEOs of a number of major oil and gas producers from the conventional sector, and we'll be meeting uh, right after this news conference with CEOs of the oil sands producers, and uh, and then later today, uh, I believe, with the service industry. Um, and we have a consistent message, which is uh, Alberta's government has uh, fought hard for a future for our energy sector. We have. Uh, worked with the industry uh, to cut uh, job-killing red tape. Uh, we have fought hard with the federal government uh, to help save uh, billions of dollars for the industry with policies like equivalency on the major emitters levy, on methane regulations. Uh, we managed to get the federal government to remove gaseous fuels from the clean fuel standard. We got the billion dollars for the well site reclamation program. We got uh, equivalence, we got the Species at Risk Act equivalency that, that avoided massive sterilization of land in northern Alberta uh, and, uh, and much more. So our point has been that we've done everything we can to ensure a bright future for our energy workers and, and now with strong prices and good future prospects, we hope the ener energy industry will do its part because after all, but part of my message is the resource that they develop belongs to the people of Alberta and the people of Alberta have got to see some benefit when uh, these companies are able to repair their balance sheets from the crisis last year. 
Uh, when they've got strong cash flow and good profits, we want to see uh, that uh, reflected in additional exploration and production and capital spending and job creation. I think they, they're hearing the message loud and clear. Uh, some of them told us this morning that they're still working on repairing the uh, damage done to their uh, finances during the price cri cr collapse last year. Uh, but they are grad they're, they're looking forward. I, I think the consensus I heard today is they're looking forward to a gradual gradual expansion of their upstream activity. Uh, some of them are hiring more people, and they expect to see that. I think what they were really saying was a, a kind of gradual ramp up in employment as opposed to a sharp increase. Some of them were expressing concern about uh, labor availability, and I heard the same thing visiting Riggs um, in Travis's riding in uh, the GP area last week. So um, uh, my response was, well, there's one solution to uh, a shortage of labor, and that's uh, wage inflation and I think after the cost cutting of the past five years uh, the market has to respond with some uh, with some higher wages and 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 um, more generous contact contract terms with uh, service companies but that's up to them it's a market those are market decisions at the end of the day I'm just reminding them that uh, uh, Albertans only resource and we sure hope that they'll see some employment benefit from these good prices Investors uh, have been telling the companies, at least that's what they're saying, is that they want to see return on capital, they want to see money in dividends and share buybacks, they don't want to see money spent on more production. So what are you prepared to do to make sure that they spend more money, other than just ask them to spend more money? Well, uh, uh, to paraphrase Wilfred Laurier, right now I'm, we're using the, the sunny way of persuasion, um, and um, I, 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 I think these companies understand that they, they have in Alberta's government a defender of their industry, uh, and Albertans support the industry, but they do want to see some benefits uh, in terms of grow, growing employment. So we'll just continue to remind them of that. Uh, this is an industry, you know, we, we, we want to have a productive uh, relationship with the industry, but uh, it's got to result not just in, in strong royalty payments to the Alberta Treasury, but in, st but in strong employment returns uh, to working Albertans. And uh, that's a message we'll continue to convey. Um, I get it. Of course, uh, investors want to see strong returns, and they're getting that. I mean, I think they're, they're, you're seeing uh, very strong, uh, almost record cash flow, potentially uh, record profits. Um, uh, understandably, there is still an overhang from the past five years and, and the crisis of last April in particular. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, you know what? There is go I, I think most forecasters foresee a global shortage in energy supply because of a scarcity of upstream investment around the world uh, in the last couple of years in particular. Uh, so I do think they, they will need to increase their capital programs uh, to meet that, uh, that growing future demand. That's okay, thanks I very think. much, everyone. Appreciate it.